Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bovis Beer and Banter, sponsored by Magic Drop. Firstly, can I thank you all for, for joining me tonight, which we really appreciate. And I'm sure we're all a lot happier than we were this time last week. Four points out of six from two tough away games gives us that little bit of breathing space for the three-week break. Uh, and dare I say it, we'll all be back at the stadium watching Championship football next year. Um, quite a few nods there, I'm sure, after this week. I think we should, fingers crossed, we should, we should be safe. Maybe one more, one more win. Uh, just before we start, I've just got Magic Rock, uh, who uh, sponsored the Watford, sh- uh, Watford game where we won 2-0. I've donated all the shirts back to, to the foundation for them to auction off. Uh, and they've kindly given us Ryan Schofield's shirt, which was which is signed uh, and we won 2-0. Uh, and Magic, with what, if anybody's interested in uh, bidding for, for Ryan's shirt, all you have to do is go to... To the website, the foundation website, or email them at foundation at htafcfoundation.com. Just put your name down, enter your bid, uh, and if yours is the highest bid, you'll win right Ryan's shirt. So I'd just like to thank Magic Rock for supporting the foundation. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing they're doing to donate all the shirts back. Uh, so if anybody's interested, go to that email and, and put your bid in. Uh, just before we start again, I know we've got a few new faces again, and I say it every week. If anybody wants to ask a question, just press the raise, raise your hand icon button, and I'll come to you as soon as possible. Or if you want to put it on the chat, I'll I'll ask the question for you. It's laid back. It's a bit of fun, so you can ask as many questions as you want. Or if you just want to listen to his guests, just feel free uh, sit there and enjoy what they have to say. So let's get to his guests straight away. And again, take no introduction, two firm fans' favourites, 70 goals between them in in the time they were at the club. Uh, The strike partnership for the great escape. Obviously, we've got Wayne Allison and Marcus Stewart. Evening, lads. Evening. Evening, Birdie. Evening, you all right? Very well, thank you. Thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate it. And we're going to get straight back to, and if we can remember that long, you beginning of your two careers, and I'll start with you, Stuart. Obviously, you started at Bristol Rovers, uh, but I didn't realise you were a massive Bristol City fan. So, what was it like signing for for your arch ri- rivals way back then? Um, as a player, you wanted to just play football. So, you know, the fact that I was a Bristol City fan really went out the window straight away. Um, as it, as it happens back then, Bristol Rovers youth team development, how they developed players was a lot better than cities. Um, so, but now nowadays things are different. But back then, it was the right thing to do for me. I mean, I lived, I lived two, two and a half miles from Bristol City ground. So um, I joined Rovers at 13. So by the time I got to 18, I was, I was being in the first team quite a lot, um, 19, 20, 21. 22, uh, I had to move away from the area because things were getting a bit um, aggressive at times towards people that lived around where I lived towards me. So I moved away to the Bristol River side of town. Um, but it was something I had to do as a player. Um, and I don't regret it one little bit because um, it took me to where I am, where I was as a player and to, 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 the, to the next level, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was a, it was a great decision. Did it tug on my heartstrings? No, it didn't. No, no wonder a bit. That's unbelievable that you got a bit. Of, you got a stick from the Bristol City fans as well, saying you want a Bristol City. Fan. And it is, it is your your career after, at the end of the day, isn't it? You've got to make decisions like that. It, it, you're right, Beardy is, but I think sometimes it's so narrow minded, and the because it's a big derby as well. You just see the football, and they're so passionate um, for it to happen to a player quite often. Um, getting into trouble, trying to cause trouble with a player happened all the time, really. So, yeah, it was, I, I get it, but um, I think it was made worse that I was from Bristol City's side of town, and um, not, not even ninety-five percent of the people that lived in South Bristol, where I'm from, are Bristol City fans. So I couldn't really get away with it. So I had to move away from the area and go and go, go to the other side of town. That's how bad it got, really. Um, yeah. I know Chief used to play for him as well. I'm, I know I remember Chief being at Bristol City himself. So it was, um, 
I, I actually did want to hook up with him one day as a as a strike partner. So it was nice to actually for it to happen. Oh, bro. And going on to you, Chief, you were exactly the same as Stuart. You were Huddersfield born and bred. You supported Huddersfield as a lad. Uh, but you signed for Halifax Town. What happened? How did you slip through the Huddersfield Town youth setup? Well, first of all, um, I, I was also a ball boy. I just thought I was, like, I was also a boy. And, and I wanted to be a ball boy for um, Keegan's last game at Leeds Road. But um, yes. th- th- that's a long story. Anyway. We'll go back on to the question that you asked me. The um, Well, plain and simple, um, Huddersfield didn't want me. So um, went to Halifax where there was um, a lot of waifs and strays, a lot of players, um, young players who were um, all from other clubs that, that, that weren't wanted. So, um, you know, we just formed a half-decent team. So you said Huddersfield didn't want you. Who were the players then, then in the youth setup that were, were better than you? Well, they were... They were <laughs> They were loads. I think that was the, um, the, I think it was a year above, I think it was at the uh, Julian, Julian Winter, uh, yep. and Andy yep. Watson, the, uh, Robert Regist. Uh, Peter Butler. Winston. Oh, oh that, that, yeah, I think it was slightly a year older, but they, they were uh, permanent fixtures in the, in the youth team and someone went on again. So it, 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 it's football. So uh, it was what it was. Brilliant. Cheers, Chief. And just, uh, we've got quite a lot of questions popping up, Mark. You this, said there was not going to be no questions. Not for you. I told you there'd be none for you. There's none for you. There's none. <laughs> Nobody's interested in, in you, Stuart. <laughs> Stuart, I'm, this is for me, really, and it's we've just been talking about it. I'm going back to the playoffs. Bristol Rovers versus Huddersfield Town. Huddersfield Town 2, Bristol Rovers 1. I don't like to, to rub it in, but I've never heard your point of view in that game. How do you... How did you feel after that game? Do you think unlucky or whether did the best team win? Um, I think I think we were unlucky looking back at the second half back in the day. I've seen the, the highlights since then. Um, hitting the post, close shaves. But, you know, Neil Warnock was a shrewd manager and, you know, some managers get luck through their career and you don't know why but they earned that luck somehow um, so yeah I mean you guys won the game and you were a good team you, you know you, obviously you and Jeppo up front Chris Billy um, so Franny and goal you had a, a good steady strong team we, we knew that how you were going to play but I think it was about both teams trying to put the ball in the net but we had different styles that, of course you know you you and Jeppo were strong and held the ball up, won the first contact quite a lot, got players at the pitch, got crosses in the box. And on the day, I think we didn't deal with that. But there was a phase, I think, five, ten minutes when that happened in the second half. And I think that's when Chris got his goal, to, which was the winner, of course. Um, so, yeah, we were unlucky, but, you know, unlucky teams that always win. And I think with you guys, probably deserved it in the end work. Because you got you got the goal and you you worked to your strength. So disappointing, of course. Yeah, of course I was at the time, but look at a year on, I wasn't because I joined Huddersfield in the championship. So but the silver lining for, for me, Booby, was to score at Wembley, which is something I've never I've always wanted to do as a as a as a as a as a player, as a kid, when I played for England in the fifteens, um, right through to to the start of my career. And that was the first opportunity I had to score at Wembley. And I did. So you know, as a striker, that's a bit of a silver lining that you 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 achieved a, a boyhood goal to score at Wembley. Um, so that kind of took the edge off it a bit. But and I was young as well, and I did. You know, it meant. I think it meant more. The loss meant you could see that the older guys were really hurting because as you get older, I think you care a bit more. When you play, when you're younger, you just go off the cuff and play football, and you're almost still in the playground a bit. Um, I was still in my early years. So I think it hit the, the, the older lads a bit harder than it did me because they they probably won't get the opportunity again. And that was the, some of them might have been their last chance to ever play play at Wembley or even a playoff final. And I get I got that as I got older. Um, but yeah, I think, and I, I, and I said, we spoke about it briefly, Booby, but we haven't. So uh, you deserve to win a game, simple as that. Um, and I'm glad you did because I went there. 
But I've got a question for you, Booby. And yep. do you remember there was a uh, some sort of rumour that your your wife had won the lottery that day as well? Um, that was in the paper that night. So we, we all come off the pitch and we're always like, we all lost the game. But there was a rumour amongst the lads at the time. Bloody hell, not only has he won the playoff final, his, his missus won the, some sort of lottery. And I, but I don't, I'm not sure what it was. So is that true or not? I don't, have you heard that? Well, yeah. Well, Stuart, I cannot believe you're bringing the, that out, Stuart. This is 25 years ago. And, and firstly, before I answer that, uh, I'm glad you mentioned your goal. You scored at Wembley. Uh, I've had 25 years of you stealing my thunder. I, I'd scored at Wembley. 44th minute of the game. There were 60 odd thousand people there. I'm there celebrating the atmosphere, trying to take in the atmosphere. 57 seconds later, you go up this other end of the pitch, score your goal, go off at half time, and everything's Marcus Stewart like, and my goal's completely forgotten. So I had 57 seconds where you have <laughs> 45 minutes to, to enjoy your enjoy enjoy yours. But but going back to that, yeah. At the time, after once I'd finished, I did think I'd won the lottery. Thought I'd won twenty five thousand. I thought my wife had won twenty five thousand pound. And I know a lot ah. of fans will probably hear this, but I'll, I'll quickly tell you, Stuart. Now you've asked, yeah, the one they were doing the the wives and girlfriends wags had a, a coach coming down to Wembley on that morning, and it was a Sunday morning. Uh, and what what she did was she scratched the 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 lottery scratch cards. Uh, you that know, falls out of a new paper. And it was like £25,000, £25,000. See page 23 for the final amount. So she looked at page 23, final amount, £25,000. So she'd won, won, so she'd won, and apparently all the wives, all, all the wags had checked it and it were all right. So so what Warnock did five minutes before, after his pre-match, the wives came in and just stopped, met us all because we'd been down for about four days. And... Uh, and my wife came up to me and said, wish me good luck for the game and said, I've won £25,000, not lost it. And obviously, we're talking 25 years ago. We, I think I went on about £600 a week or, or whatever. And I think the bonus for that game was about 800 quid. So it was were, it were massive. So after the game, obviously, I was lucky enough to score. I got man of the match and we got promoted. So I went on television and said, what a day I've had. Man of the match, I've scored a goal. And my wife's won £25,000 on the lottery. So obviously that would all it would on it were on the nine o'clock, ten o'clock news back then, the front and back pages of all the tabloids on every radio station up and down. So, so I've gone into a players bar then, hug, hug my wife and says, obviously we've got six weeks off now. Where let's go on a nice holiday, spend this money. And he said, Well, I've not exactly won it. And I said, I said, No, don't tell me, don't tell me that. I've told all press it, I've told all the country. And uh, and what she did, she done. Scratched it off, £25,000, £25,000, Sunday movie, movie scratch card. We were only looking at News of the World newspaper, weren't they? Oh. And that is, God, that is a true story. And that is me. the first, first ever thought of a wag. The wags are unbelievable, aren't they? They have a different week to, to everybody. And my wife was meant to be like intelligent. She's a solicitor. So she went to one intelligent one. What chance have we got? So I can't believe, I'll still get asked that now when it says Stuart, 25 years on. <laughs> and Chief, before we go to the to the uh questions, uh from I know there's quite a few with their hands up. Uh you coming to Woodersfield, Chief, that must have been a tough decision because we were rock bottom of the league, we'd not won a game, it was in November. Uh Swindon were top of the league. Uh you were obviously the fans loved you at Swindon. So what made you come back to Woodersfield? Were it just a pull of your hometown club? Yeah, of course. Um, it, it, everyone wants to play for their hometown club. And it's, um, it's an ambi- it was an ambition then. The opportunity came up and it, it was great. Um, unfortunately, my, my mother passed away, so I didn't play straight away. So uh, it, it, it was a, a bit of a bit of sweet um, situation, really. But um, yeah, the, the lure of playing for town was, uh, was great. So no-brainer. I'm sure we'll get in later on. I'm sure we'll get in about your partnership and, and the great escape. But we'll just go to some questions. I think Joshua, Joshua G, you've got your hand up. Have you still got it up? You still you've got to unmute yourself if you if you're there. No, 
he's been bored of listening to, to me. Uh, Ryan, there's a question from Ryan. No. <laughs> but I'll go to I'll go to the questions. Hello, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's gone then, Ryan. Sorry about oh, that. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, last question for Marcus. Um, just on the how it came about, the obviously the move to Ipswich, because I remember at the time, town we were absolutely flying in the championship and doing quite well. Um, and I just remember thinking if we keep this squad and this team together, and obviously you was as main man up front getting the goals, we've got a good chance of, of promotion. And I just remember after that, after you going, it seemed to take the, the club years to sort of get, get over it, if that makes sense, and, and sort of pull on. Just How did that move come about and what were your thoughts at the time? Because it just seemed to be a little bit forced, if that, if that makes sense. Um, well, it, it came about um, a total surprise to me, is the honest truth. Um, I went and we were training at Storrs Hall at the time. I went to training on a normal, I was like, a Tuesday or a Thursday, I don't rem remember what day it was. Um, uh, got out of my car, got my training kit uh, in my bag behind me, walking towards the change of rooms at Stores Hall. Assistant manager at the time comes up to me and says, the manager wants to see you in the office. This was something like nine and a half past in the morning. Uh, so I was thinking, what, what have I done now? You know, Saturday night. Saturday night was a four nights ago. But I couldn't have done it. You couldn't have found anything out five days later. You would have got me in on the Monday. So all these sorts of things are going through your mind. What's Because the manager don't call you in for a read unless you want to get a, a bonnet in of some sort or, um, you know, some something, something along those lines. So I knocked on the door, come in. Steve Bruce tells me to come in, walks in. Morning, you know, I got on really well with Steve, although we had our arguments a lot, but I got on all right with him. Um, when it comes to training every day, we, we argue and forget about things. So um, he went, Marcus, just, just to let you know, um, Ipswich have come in, in for a year. We've accepted the bid. He didn't tell me how much it was. Uh, and you can go and talk to them if you want. And it was as quick as that. And I went, yeah, OK, then. And I will do. And that was it. Uh, and within within 20 minutes, I was back in my car on my way down to Ipswich. And it was that simple. So my reasons why I wanted, why I did go in the end was because I looked at it. The club could have turned down that bid and not let me know that that was the case. The fact that he got me in the room and told me that they've accepted a bid already told me the right was on the wall in a way because... He he, know, he had no reason to tell me that there was a bid in the first place. So the fact that Huddersfield accepted the bid and he accepted the bid and the chairman did told me that you know we, we, we want you to go. He never actually said to me, we, we, you know, we want you to go or whatever. We don't want you to go. That was never relayed. If that conversation I had with him was, was as quick as I just told you it. Um, so for me, the, the, the club in my eyes were willing to sell me to another club. It's that simple. That's, that's unbelievable, that's Stuart. And, uh, I was looking, did a little bit of research on it, and Ian Air, Ian Air put a statement out, and, it, and I'll just read it. Uh, reason for selling Marcus Stewart was because he was a, a, deep, a depreciating asset. And I, I looked up, after you, you went, obviously, for Muddersfield, you played 360 games, five years in the Premier League, scored over 100 goals, Second in the Premier League top goal scoring. I think he got it wrong. In, uh, well, we know he got it wrong, but it's got to be one of the worst decisions in the club's history to sell you. I've, I've never, I've never heard that statement from him. Um, so, uh, well, well, that might not be right then. I might, might in Wikipedia. So, don't believe everything. Don't be reading Oh, by this, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 not that I've tried to look for anything like that movie. I haven't, I haven't looked for a statement like that. But if he has written that, then. In a business point of view, he got he got he got it wrong massively, hasn't he? Really, it's un un unbelievable, un absolutely ridiculous decision. And I could understand a point to to sell you to a Premier League club. If you were a Premier League club, then yeah, fair enough, they're letting you go for that. But to a rival, to, and I didn't realise you scored on on your it when you scored against Huddersfield on on your yeah. home debut. Yeah, that must have been quite nice actually, even though you, the Huddersfield fans were so brilliant to you. You know what? It, 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 you know, you see fans, players these days go up and don't celebrate when they're playing against their old clubs. I did the opposite. 
um, like you say, Ruby, you can get the feeling I, I had at the time. Reason why I did the opposite wasn't it was no disrespect to the fans whatsoever. Um, it was because I didn't feel wanted. Does that make sense? Yes, by yes, the no, club, sorry. by the club, and by the people that were manager, assistant, chairman, the people that ran. I, I didn't feel wanted. Um, so I think that's why I celebrated so well. And if I think you see the goal back, I ran towards their dugout as well. I didn't do anything at the dugout, but I ran towards the dugout and celebrated in front of the dugout. And that was. Yeah, because that, it could have been scooped, it could have been stopped. Uh, but I was at a new club. It's a relief to get off the mark, especially at home, as you know. Um, and it was almost it was almost something a relief that I scored and probably proved people right. It, even though I felt, even though looking back now, I probably didn't have to prove anyone right. But that's that what that was what it was like. It was a it was a happy, bittersweet moment. That, that's what it was. Yeah, totally understand, Stuart. And, and like you said when you, you felt not wanted, even, and, and Chief's probably exactly the same, when the club, even for me, when the club came in and said, Sheffield Wednesday, we've accepted a bid, £2.7 million into the Premier League. Absolutely, totally understandable. I'd not asked to go, but it was the right move for everybody. But there's all then. Yeah. Thinking, well, the club wanting to get rid of me and don't, don't want me. So, in your part, I can totally agree. I can totally understand that. So, yeah, and that's you, 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 when you said to me about it and you said how you felt, that's exactly how I felt. I t- totally understand that, Stuart. We really do. I do. Josh, have you got your hand up, Joshua G? Or no, yep, you're muting yourself. No, I'll, I'll, Chief. There's one from Andrew here. You were signed for Swindon by Steve McMahon. Obviously, he was a great player, but what kind of manager was he? I, I think he was a. Um, I think he was a really, really good uh, man manager, in my respect. Um, and he, what what he what he created was it was an environment of working things out for yourself. So he was in the, the top Liverpool sides and the top Everton sides, whatever, throughout his career, where he, he played with players who worked things out. So he assembled a really good, um, experienced team of, um, of players who he thought could, could work things out. So it, it, cause he needed, needed we just, um, just got relegated, so he wanted, wanted to get promoted. And it, it was one of those where... He had a good blend of, 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 of teams. We we didn't work on we didn't work on much in terms of during training. Um, less running, which was happy days, um, and and also it, it changed the way how I played. It changed from because um, I was always the second striker. For, believe it or not, I used to have some pace. <laughs> No, so, so I was only <laughs> nothing, Chief. I can't say anything, can I? <laughs> I, I was only, I used to be the second striker at Bristol City, etc. So then, w- when he, uh, he, he he pulled me, he bought me, and he says, "Right, okay, this is how I want you to play. Just play between the eighteen-yard box. Don't go over the halfway line unless there's um, set pieces. But just stay between the eighteen-yard box, and people out wide will provide for you. We had the likes of." Paul Allen on the right, we had um, Mark Walters on the left. So it was it was just raining crosses. It was absolutely brilliant. So so he basically changed from uh, um, a second striker to a target man. And that's where uh, that was that transition when I was about 26, 27. I had to learn how to be a target man, which wasn't easy to start off with. But then obviously you did such a good job at it and when you came to town, what, how, why do you think you two hit it off so well? Fifty, I think yes, it was fifty-seven games, forty-four goals between you in that eighteen months, and you oh. scored forty of them. <laughs> <laughs> I got my customary four. <laughs> I got forty. Chief, I'm building you up here. I'm building no, I, you. I, I, I give you my opinion. Um, I, I think we were just. I, I was used to playing with with a target man anyway, wherever I was at. Um, Bristol Rovers, Devon White, uh, Gareth Taylor. Um, obviously, then, then then come to Huddersfield and being alongside the chief most of the time, really. Um, 
And I kind of like that. And there, there was what Chief did really well, what I could say back from my experiences was he would always be talking to you. And I was, I was 27 at the time, no, 25, 26. So I was still pretty medium for a player. still learning the game a little bit, really. Um, and Chief was on the pitch communicating constantly. So he used to say for goal kicks, I always remember this. Um, when it was a goal kick for us, he just said, Marcus, don't be so still. And we used to jog like between the cent- like two centre halves, like past each other. When there was a goal kick being taken, he said, oh, what? just jog, just jog, just jog. And it was always like, and I, and I always t- wondered why he did that. I just did it because he was a more experienced player than me. So I thought I'd just do what he did or what he asked me to do. But I always, when you get older, you look back and think, why, why has he asked me to do that? And looking back, it's because you're on your toes already, to, ready to react to something in one of his flick-ons or something that might happen with the ball instead of being flat-footed. Um, at the time, I didn't realise that, but that's you know those sort of things stick in your mind and you kind of pass that bit, those bits of information on. Um, and I think, ultimately, I think we got on all right off the pitch as well, Chief, didn't we? Uh, you know, I think that, which I think helps as well. Yeah, I, I, I thought I thought it was a, I thought the level of understanding was great because we, we played a form of four four two, but it was like a four four one one where um, I, I think when when people ask me how, why it worked is because he used to drop in there, drop it to midfield, maybe pick the ball and play between the lines, and also it, I thought what what you were great at was assessing the flight of the ball that was booted up to me. So if if it was going to drop or um, the centre half couldn't head it very, very well, he was always in and around the area where he could pick it up, pick it up. Mm. And if it was a case of there was always going to be a flick on, you was on your bike. So I, I just I just thought he was a great assessor of that as well as as well as when you do did get it, you, you weren't wasteful. And it was it was good quality. It was just um, it worked. It, it clicked really really well. And we'll leave yeah. you off the pitch, one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> question, question for Chief from James Beth. Where did the nickname originate from, and who gave it to you? Oh, we just have not got enough time for that. So it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's such a long story. It is fine. Chief, we're, we're Chief you can cut it down. No, we can't. I can't. Oh no, 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 we can't. <laughs> Good question though. Thank you. Who gave it to you? I can't even tell us who gave it to you. I can't say that. It's, no. it's honestly, but it's a long story. I'll, I'll get it off him, James, and then we'll have a chat later. So, a question from Daniel for Marcus. Oh, this is a good question. Did you feel any pressure coming to town replacing the forward lineup of uh, Rocket Ron and, and Andy Booth? Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry, Boothie. That's all right. Well, I, did, I, I didn't. I mean, I, I, through the years, I kind of, I don't know why, but I would never, ever felt any pressure. Um, you know, a lot of players might get sold. I don't know how you felt with this movie when you moved to Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, you know, the price tag weighs heavy on you, uh, but it didn't with me. Um, I, I knew I was going into a good club. I knew I was replacing two, two good strikers. Jeppo was there for about, a week or two before he left, so I had, a, I had about two week two weeks preseason with him before he moved on. I don't know where he moved on to, um, but I didn't feel the pressure that um, most players might. But I just went into a club with my eyes wide open, wanting to learn more. Really, um, never been away from Bristol in my life, unless it was on holiday to Ionapa at the time. But I never lived anywhere else apart from Bristol, and it was a new, totally new feeling for me. So. I didn't feel any pressure. And, and, I, and when I moved on again, I didn't feel pressure. I was just one of those people that would just take it in my stride, which I, I assume is a pretty good thing, really, um, looking back on it. Uh, I was just there to play football for that team. And, and to be fair to, to you, sir, and I'll come, come on to, to Peter's question in, in a minute. Uh, the the Huddersfield fans, from the Bristol Rovers playoff final, for a year, they wanted you to come to the to the club. They absolutely loved you, and there were so many people. Can we get Stewie? Can we? We need to. We need want to bring Stewie in. So, so the fans knew about you and knew what you could do even before you came, didn't you? And, and Peter's question is, Stewie, how soon after the playoff final did you hear Town wanted to sign you? 
uh, it wasn't towards until the end, end of the end of that the, the season after that that final. So I had the final. Then I had a, another full season with Bristol Rovers, which is I think I got thirty goals that season in, le- in league league one as it is now. Um, and it was towards the end, you know, w- w- when it could have happened. There was no Bosman back in these days, so it couldn't be released early. You had to wait to the end of the season to your contract to finish an end sign for a club, which is what happened. So uh, it was Dennis. Uh, Dennis Booth was a big part in it because obviously Brian Horton was there and Dennis was my assistant manager at Bristol Rovers the two years previously and in the playoff final against Huddersfield. He left that year that after that game to go and join Brian Horton at Huddersfield. So at the end of that season, the year later, he was a big part in it because I had a really good relationship with Dennis when he was assistant manager at Rovers and he was saying to you to make the end of the season, you know, come to us, it's good, it's good. So he was a big part to play in that, is the honest truth. And Stuart, just obviously when you when you came, that next 18 months, the, the club didn't do well, did they, under Brian Horton? You still, I think you came, what, about 16, 6th from bottom, and then obviously got bottom before Chief and everybody came in. Why were that? Because you had a good, you did have a good squad. You look, you look at the players that, that Brian bought, it was a strong squad, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um... You know, with obviously Andy Morrison coming as well, Andy Payton coming in the same time as me. We did have a strong squad. Um, I, I went into the club and I, I played a few games. I, I got a strange injury, uh, which I was playing with for ages. So I wasn't myself. And you, you guys would know what it's like playing with an injury. You try your hardest to get through it. The fans don't see that you got some sort of niggly injury, but you might get away with it for one game. But if you play 10 games, you know, you're know you not yourself and you can't play yourself. So I was playing with a little bit of a niggly injury for a little while. And I remember chatting to Brian Horton about this and saying, listen, it's affecting me for I'm not, not really contributing like I'd like to. Um, and you know what managers are like back then? They, they think you're lying. And I, I swear they thought I was lying. You know, uh, I was, well, so why are you sprinting? Well, the truth is I'm sprinting fine because it doesn't hurt when I sprint. It's when I, I'm walking and jogging, when I'm putting weight on it for long periods, that's when it hurts. So they couldn't quite understand it. So anyway, I had, a, I had a, uh, some sort of um, keyhole look at the, the injury. And I, I, mean, I had a cyst on my bone. I had to have it cut out. I was out for another another month and a half with a cat on a cast because in a nutshell, you know, uh, people didn't want to get it sorted out earlier because they didn't think there was anything wrong with me. Um, so that put me out for a little while. But, you know, these, I don't, these things happen... You know, we've all played with injuries, guys, and I just wish I would have been a bit stronger when I was a player. Then I might have been able to do something at that time a lot more to get us out of trouble uh, than I was able to. Just, and ju- I'm just looking at the chat here. Some of the, the messy five minute chat to sell Marcus and years for the club to regret it. Best English striker not to play in the, in the Premier League. Obviously, for Huddersfield, obviously, he did play in the Premier League. Uh, Tips, which are interesting, very honest answer by Marcus. I think selling Marcus set the club back years, massive mistake. Uh, and just before I carry on with, with Peter's question, Chief, obviously you you were you came to the club and Jacko it was Jacko's first managing uh, uh, job. What were, what would Jacko like then? Because he's come to we know what he was like as a player, full of life. Uh, but you were rock bottom. Uh, they would you were relegated, weren't you? Uh, so. What would Jacko? What did he say to the players to, to change the season? Absolutely now? brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And, and Marx will, will tell you that um, what he was like as a player, he was, he was exactly the same as as a as a manager. Wore a heart on his sleeve, very emotional, but um, very very passionate about town and about the team that that he assembled. And you know, he was always a firm believer that we was going to get out of it. It, it, it never wavered at all. We was always going to get out. Wasn't that right, Marcus? It was he was always of the viewpoint that we we're going to get out? And um, yeah, okay, we, we needed some snookers at times, but uh, we, we got we got there in the end. I think. It, but <laughs> but he was really supportive and, and passionate uh, with with the, all of us. And, yeah, I love Jacko. Yeah, and it, it, you look at the signings he made. Obviously, Barry Orn, Lee Richardson, Dave Phillips. Steve Harper, Grant Johnson, and obviously yourself, Chief. 
he, he deserves a lot of credit on the transfer market to, to bring them players in. Uh, and I presume he wouldn't have had much of a budget. No, you, 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 he brought in a lot of experience um, into the team. Look, like Sir David Phillips and um, Barry Hall, uh, the internationals, and they, they, they were immense in terms of how they went about the, the business on and off the pitch. And it just, just raised standards because, you know, Barry was, uh, I don't know, 38, 39, but he was always at the front with all the running. He, he, was, a, he was a fit as, and, and he, he got to the players and he, he, he demanded that, that we played properly. And, um, you know, it, yeah, Barry loved them all, but it, it, was, it, was, it was always um, in, in, the, in the best interest of the game. It, it was good signings. What about Taff? What... what? Influence did Taff have in, in, in that? Because they made a great partnership. I know, obviously, I came back and Jacko and Taff came in 2003, but Taff back then, it was, oh, it was scary in 2003 when it mellowed. So I presume when it, it'll have been horrifying when, in 1996 when you were rock bottom of the league. That, I, I, th- I think he mellowed. No, no, he didn't. No, no, it, <laughs> no it, it, it was great, and it, and it, and it simplified everything. And um, it, it's just the fact that um, he was very demanding on you and on 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 us as players and and as a team. And um, it, I think it must have hurt him in, in terms of um, the position where we were. But um, it, it, it's, always, it's always it's that smile that he always used to have when uh, when you were in pain. It was that that smile. It just uh, yeah, it, it made you angry. <laughs> Question uh, from Peter to, to Marcus. Um, obviously, you, you've, you've been in coaching, uh, Stewie. Have you had any ambition to be a manager? And if so, would you apply for the town job uh, if the manager's job came up? Uh, I love coaching. Um, to be a manager, it's a tough job. Um, it's, I never say never to anything at this moment in time. You know, I'm, you know what I'm doing with you. I'm just having a bit of a break. 30 years of 30 years 40 years of football elite football takes its toll a bit uh, and we're always we're all used to neglecting our family over the years for whatever reason dragging them around the country or not seeing them because you're in another part of the country and I decided to, that I wasn't going to do that anymore um, for the moment so yeah I'm still learning I've done my pro license with Chief a few years ago Chief was actually my tutor on my pro license so he was there telling me what to do so he's told me what to do as a footballer, as a player. Now I've gone coaching. He's turned up telling me what to do when it comes to doing my <laughs> coaching badges. So, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so yeah. So, yeah. What, would I like to be a manager? Yes, I would uh, one day. But I'm 48 now. I'm realistic. You know, to be a manager at 48, 50 for your first time is, is quite a tough thing to do. Um, but I've certainly got experience over 500 games as an assistant manager I've done now. So... I've got the experience behind me. I know what I like and know what I want. But like I say, for for I'm gonna I'm gonna be refreshing and say family come first for once, Booby. Yeah, yeah, totally understand, Stuart. Yeah, yeah, can understand that. And going on to to Chief, uh, obviously doing my research, I, I went on Wikipedia and the first line was Doctor Wayne Allison. <laughs> And I thought, I know you can't believe everything in Wikipedia, but surely you can't be a doctor as well, Chief. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. It, it, a it doc- is true. It's true. A, a doctor of what? <laughs> yes, the, the look of surprise on your face. Yes. Uh, I, I have a PhD um, in, in sports science and coaching from uh, Sheffield Hallam University. So, oh. Yeah, um, did it part time while I was um, at uh, where, where was I? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I was at so Sheffield United. Chesterfield. She- Sheffield United, and then Chesterfield. Yeah, so se- seven years part time, just something to do in the afternoons. That uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Oof, wow. Yeah, they were tough though. I can imagine you were hard enough as a player. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound hard. Finishing at half past twelve, going home and. And sitting exactly. on the city and watching, watching telly, uh, that would hard enough. But for you then in an afternoon to go and obviously go to university, I take my hat off to you. That that's some like Johnny Dyson did it, but obviously in the early part of his career, he he were university full time. But you know, mm. do it later on. That that's that's brilliant, and you deserve you deserve it, chief. Deserve everything. And, and did it. 
Doctor Ch- Doctor Chief. Now I should go. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on. And th- I got this question right at the beginning. I didn't understand it. And Stu, you might have to. It's from Adele. Marcus, can you eat a KFC without singing "Give me, give me, give me a fried chicken"? A reference to a town video back in the day. No, <laughs> I don't. I haven't got a clue what that is on about. Is the honest truth? <laughs> no, no, Chief. To I can eat a don't... KFC though. No, I mean, <laughs> But it's come up. It's, it's the second one that's come up. So from town fans, they must, they must. I, I say I, I can't help you there, Stuart. I don't know. We'll quickly move on then. Mark for Stu again from Andrew. Marcus was good enough, for, obviously, for the Premier League for five years. But does he think he would have adapted? He'd already played. And his advice to a young striker going through a barren spell, not scoring. So I suppose it's for both of you. What would you? But a striker who's not scoring, what's the best advice you could give? Um, I would just say keep believing in yourself. Keep just keep doing the things you're, you're doing. Seek advice of your coaches if you're not sure. Have a chat with your coaches because when you're not playing well, it does play on your mind. And people have a tendency to go in on themselves and keep things to themselves. So whether it's your coach, your, your mum, your dad, talk, talk to them. If you're the mum or dad, try and talk to the the the, the, the girl or boy who, who's your son or daughter, um, um, and try and look to ways to improve and have a look why why you're not why you're not why you're going on a barren spell. Are you living right? Are you doing the things right? Did you do the things right that week that you did the previous week? Look at everything really. Um, but the most important thing for me is try and talk it out with your coach. And your coach at the time might give you some valuable information that gets you back on track that you forgot about over the weeks. Chief, I'm sure you didn't go on a barren spell. I'm not saying well, that. I had loads and loads. <laughs> so I can speak from experience here. So, <laughs> so it's a okay. case. Okay. I think Marx is dead right. Speak to the coach. They can help you because there might be just something that you, that you haven't been doing that you were doing previously. Also, I, I think what, what's key that would help you with your mindset is that keep trying to get in those, those same positions because a chance will come and keep trying to um, be effective for the team. So still close people down, still work back, still work really, really hard because if you're contributing with the other side and not with goals, you'll still play. And if you're playing, opportunities will, will still come. So it would be just one one shot will come off your knee or something like that and it'll kickstart you again. So keep trying to get in, the, in those positions like you were before and keep working hard for the team. Good. Well, I mean, before we start, my, my, my longest barren spell was nine games without a goal, which is, can be two or three months. I don't know what yours guys were. The bo- booby, what were your, yours, Wayne? Uh, a bit I'm, longer than that. Okay. My, my, <laughs> I, think, I think mine were about 12, 13 games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's terrible, isn't it? You just plays on your mind and you can't see you're scoring another no. goal. You can't see where your next goal's coming from. And then they just come and you just go back to not it happens yeah. again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then you got you got it comes in clusters then, doesn't it? Yeah. It goes and it, it, does. it just comes back. But it's it, when you're out of sync, you are out of sync. And, and it, there's there's nothing it just it just feels is this still your body? You know, and, and you think, well, surely I, I, I well, I can control that, but you can't. And it's, but yeah, I think you just have to work through it. You, if the uh, manager wants you to, that is. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, I don't know what how you felt. I had, I had managers. Um, uh, who was the manager? I'm trying to think who it was. A guy called Paul Tisdale towards the end of my career when I was at Exeter City, which settled my mind. He would say to me, right, Marcus, you're going to play the next three games now, just so you know. Uh, and bit, actually, Mick McCarthy used to do it at Sunderland. It wasn't Paul. You're going to play the next three games and go for it. And you might play longer than that, but I'm just letting you know for the next three games you're playing. I know you haven't scored for five games, but I don't care. You're still going to play the next three games, just so you know. And he would do that quite often, you know, when you might have not scored for three or four games. Straight away, you're thinking, oh, no, I don't, what's going to happen to me placing the team? But... Um, I learned that that set on my mind and my nerves because, you know, you're always thinking, oh, if I, I've got to score the next game, otherwise I'm not going to play the next game. You know, that's it got to that stage at times for me. So for a manager to say to you, right, 
I don't care where you're at the mark, middle mark because you're going to play next four games. That kind of took the pressure off you instantly. You know, yeah. of playing for your That'd place. Right, so yeah. Happened to you guys. Yeah, what what I'm to, I think um, Neil, Neil Warnock was great for me. Um, he he shifted the emphasis of score off scoring. So he, he, he would say, so you're, you're in the team. This will just do these things for me and you, you're playing. So hold the ball up, win your flick on and get in the box. It was just that. Mm. Oh, oh if, you can, if, you can, if you can bag a goal, great. But if you do these three things, then, then that's great because you're contributing to the team. And that was it. So he took the pressure of scoring totally off in the yeah. mindset, which I thought very, very clever. Yeah. That's 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 good advice. Great advice is that. we've got a load of messages. I was trying from John Pigeon. We have mentioned a little bit about the greatest great escape season, uh, but when did you you both start to believe you would avoid relegation? Was it a game that you thought, "Hang on a minute, we can do this"? Uh, I don't remember loads of games from that season, but I do <laughs> remember one particularly, and that was Stoke away. We won one nil, and I played on the left of a. Four, five, one, or four, three, three. However you want to look at it, you know. Um, uh, and we won one nil away, uh, and we got a bit of luck that day. The ball was going wide. I struck it, and the ball was going wide. But the player went, went, went to clear, and it went into the back of the net. Um, that was that was a game when you that I think Stoke were doing all right. You know, it was at like Britannia Stadium at the time. If that that was what it was called then. Um, and that got us a one 0 win, which, in those sort of situations, to go away from home at somewhere like Stoke, a one 0 win is what it's all about, getting the results that count. So I don't know about you, Chief, but that was the one I remember. Yeah, I, 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 I can remember us going on a run, and uh, and uh, we played Reading at home or Crew away, Crew, crew at home, and and we, we were just demolishing sides. Um, <laughs> the thing where we. Um, come back and talk about uh, Peter and Taff is the fact that uh, and Marks will tell you that they wanted us to be the fittest team in the league mm. which I, I still remember that now and it's a, so every day we, we got it so uh, we, we didn't like it at the time because we were running is it the Kilna Bank and um, Leeds Road playing fields we were running those hills and it was every day and it, it was tough but having said that it was awful at the time but we were the fittest team in the league and we were finishing games stronger. So, unfortunately, although we hated to admit it, they were right and mm. we weren't finishing strong. We were scoring late goals and we looked like a really, really tough side to beat. They made us organised and um, I, th I think any any side then coming to uh, McAlpine then were in for a, a, a tough game because we made the pitch. The, the pitch was already huge. And we made it even bigger, and, and we just exploited the um, the the, um, the spaces. But um, I, I just remember the runs that, that we went on, and and Paul Dalton, he was just in a purple patch. He just he just couldn't stop scoring. Just everything he did just came off, and it was just it was just brilliant. It was brilliant to watch, which which I did the judge at the time when I was standing up front. So, Do you remember the goal he scored at Sunderland away, Chief, as well when he went down left and went on his own. I think we won one 0 It might be one all, but. Dalt scored a great goal that day from the halfway line. Can't remember. Yeah. No, but it was no. special. The only but, way uh, my, ver my version on, Ch and, and, on Jacko in, and Taff. J Jacko was the man manager, Taff was the coach. That's how I look at them. They, they, they complemented each other brilliantly when it comes to that. Yeah, you know, because Taff, Taff was serious. He was a serious <laughs> coach. And he didn't want to cross him. Whereas Jacko, he'd get, he'd get up in the morning, have it, he'd, he'd come into training, he'd chat about haircuts, you know, where'd you get your haircut? I get mine done here. <laughs> so that was Jacko. Whereas Taff would you and he'd have a chat about tactics and you know, actually you do. You know, and that was, that was where Jacko was at at the time. Obviously, as time moved on, he became more of a coach, but and I think they bounced off each other quite well. But he never, he never lost that personal aspect with the players, though. Never, no. I remember I scored, um, uh, I never scored a hat trick in the league before. I joined Huddersfield. I scored hat tricks in the cup, but not the league. And I scored my first league hat trick against Crystal Palace. It was um, at home. Come in Monday morning. Jack, who's invited me in his office again, straight away. I'm thinking, like, what have I done in the nightclub? <laughs> uh, so 
that, but it wasn't. It was the opposite. He went, "Come in here." I went, "What? What, what do you want?" Or everything. All right, boss. He went, "Yeah, I just here's your shirt here from from your game on Saturday with your name underneath it. I thought I'd get a frame for you." And I was like, "That's for me." He went, "Yeah, yeah." It was your first league hat trick, wasn't it? I went, "Yeah." And he went, "There it is for you." And it's all framed, name underneath it, first league hat trick, Marcus Stewart. Um, and that was the kind of uh, blood Jack I was. Yeah, uh, top top blog. Top yeah. blog. How did you feel then when he obviously got sacked? Barry Ruby came in. I presume things will have changed in in the club at that time. But Jacko had done well, and he saved us the great escape season. That second year, you did ever, ever so well. I think you finished about eighth or ninth, didn't you? But you were top of the league for for some. So so that summer when you had Jacko had been sacked. What, what were your thoughts? What were all the players' thoughts then? It was a shock for me. It, it, a, a total shock. We weren't expecting it. And um, I can't remember where, where I were, but um, I just thought it was a joke. I really, I really thought it was a joke. Uh, I couldn't believe it. And um, I thought, well, what are we going to do now? Because if, if we... Um, he, he assembled such a strong squad who, who believed... In, in him and he believed in us and it, it just it was just a great fit the, the team spirit was brilliant honestly brilliant um, but it, it, it's just one of those where oh what do we do now <laughs> I, I don't know about you Marcus but it just it, it was a shock for me I, I I don't remember how I felt at the time but looking back on it it was a typical scenario of the chairman wanted a big name Big name manager, more so than the manager that fitted. That's how I look at it. Because uh, Jacko was doing great. Steve Bruce was a big name, just come out of the game. Um, and that's the kind of feeling I got looking back at the time. But I, apart from that, I have, I have no feelings on it. My, my same game, when a new manager goes, there's, there's hardly, you don't get time for sentiment, really, because you move on, someone else moves in, and you've got to move on. It's... It's almost like here we go again. You know, you've got your emotion goes up and down for a day or two until the new manager comes in, and then you're back in training again. So your sanctuary is your training ground, and you might have a chat with the lads in training. What happened there? Why did he go? You know, all these sort of things. But you know, you don't, you don't get a two day break. You're training all the time. So, it, but it was it was uncalled for. That's for sure. I'm going. I'm going back just before. Obviously, Jack. Got- that uh, that's that second season, and you, I've got a board to pick with both of you again. You, be, you both made me look stupid. I went to Sheffield Wednesday, and Huddersfield Town were on Sky on the Friday night, so we were we were playing down south, so we were in a hotel, and I, they were there were about 12, 13 foreigners at Sheffield Wednesday, and I, I was telling them, "You've got to watch Huddersfield Town tonight. The top of the league, they're flying. They're a good they're a good side." So I've got them all watching. We've got it all round up. You know what it's like after his, after his meal on a Friday. We've got telly on. We're all in the room. And Barnsley versus Huddersfield Town. Barnsley, and I've checked, you both were playing. Barnsley seven, Huddersfield Town one. What happened there? You made me, The explanations I had to say that night. Keith. <laughs> <laughs> ah, um... I don't quite remember that game, funnily enough. No. You were 7 0 at half time, weren't you? Oh, when it six. Yeah. It, 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 it just, just didn't happen. It, I, I could, we couldn't put a finger on it. We, we couldn't explain it. It was just, it was just a horror show. No, nothing came off. Um, we, no, I, I can't explain it. I think I might have come off as a sub. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. Then. <laughs> So what did what did Jacko and Taff say at half time? You're seven nil down. I know there's not a lot he can say, but it must have been interesting. I can imagine what Taff would have been like. Um I, I honestly don't remember the game. And that's the honest truth. I know I know nothing of that game. Yeah. I don't can tell you. I don't I mean I'm actually surprised that you said we lost seven nil. <laughs> seven one, seven one we seven got one. Were down. Yeah, I don't remember that game. Uh, Quickly. I'm, not, I'm pretty good at putting bad things to the back of my mind and not 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 forgetting about them. So I don't I don't recall it whatsoever. You do right, Sue. So a question from Peter Swallow to Chief: 
Why did Town let you go? Uh, was it a mi- mistake? Because considering you ended up scoring 26 goals for, for Chamber after that, obviously Steve Bills had come in, he brought in Clyde uh, to play to play alongside side Stewart. Uh, obviously, was it your decision to leave or, or would it the club do? No, it, um, well, St- Steve pulled me when he when came in. And, and I think, I think what Marcus mentioned earlier, that when managers come in, they, they want their own their own team, which well we, we get. And, and we, we're football, we're uh, we're travellers, and you know it's it's one of those where I didn't fit it into his plans. And and, and you know you, you you have certain certain inklings. Um, so well, I, I think I was I can't remember what number it was a nine or fourteen, and then and my, my squad was um, thirty six. I was given. So, so you, 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 you got an idea of what's coming next. So, uh, but it, it, it wasn't, there, there were no animosity whatsoever. He just said, well, you, you're not in my plans. And if anyone comes in, you, you, you can, um, you're free to talk. Okay, fine, fine, no problem. And Steve, throughout the whole process, was, was brilliant with me. Yep, no, no problems at all. No problems at all. Apart from... Enough. Anyway, and I was going to say, I played, we were playing the League Cup uh, away at Scunthorpe or Hull. I think it was Scunthorpe. And um, I, I was never in the frame. And um, I was subbed that day. And um, I, I got on um, seven minutes towards the end. I think that's what we won. So seven minutes. So where, where, where how things work, you, you, you just think, oh, well, okay. Um, I, I got sold to Tranmere that that uh, following week or so. They end up in the final of the League Cup versus Leicester, and I was cup tied at Wembley. <laughs> so you know, it's just how things work, you know. But but who's to know that Tranmere were going to go on that amazing run at the League Cup final, the last one at uh, Wembley, and uh, yeah, I was cup tied. But uh, I enjoyed it just just like I'd won it anyway. So it didn't really matter. Brilliant. And you were all right then, Stuart, but I had to play against you, Chief, at Chamia. And I'd have loved to have known what you did during the week at training, because all you did, as soon as that ball went out for throwing half halfway line, Dave Challoner hurled it in to, to Chief, everybody get round Chief, and <laughs> you'll get bits, and, and you just come play, you play against it. And I had to be up and down that pitch trying to mark you like it's horrendous to play against what we like to play for I wasn't fun either <laughs> it was it was anywhere in the um, opposition half Dave could throw it and and if, I don't know if you saw he had different trajectories so he used to yeah. fire it in or he used to loop it to the far post or, or whatever but we did play some good stuff in amongst that it wasn't just all about Dave's long throw but it was sort of effective football I think you could call it if you could call it football yeah it worked though, it worked. So, <laughs> we've just got a couple of minutes, minutes left, a couple of questions for, from James to Marcus. A lot of clubs play a front three now. If you were playing now, uh, where would you fit in a system like that? Oh, that's a good question. I, I did, Whenever I was asked to play on the left or right of a three up front slash, back in the day, it was it was four or five one, you know, because you, you played that, that formation to kind of defend really and counter attack. However, I, whereas now it's three forwards, as we all know, is more of a possession-based kind of formation. Um, I, I don't think I couldn't play on the left or the right. Uh, I'd have to play down the middle, but I don't think I could play down the middle. Purely <laughs> because the guy down the middle isn't asked to work hard, really. He's just asked to play in behind, drift in behind defenders, hold the ball up, maybe. I don't see them working. They're there for you know, to occupy the two centre halves when you got the ball. So the honest truth is I don't think I'd be a footballer. I'd be playing rugby because I, don't, I couldn't play any of those three positions. <laughs> and me and you, Chief, what, what position could you play, Chief? Central. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go out wide, mate. No chance. <laughs> oh, Stuart, we, from Adele, thanks for asking the KFC question. It was the ending to a town VHS Back in the day, the song was played and the players shoved chicken in his in his mouth. <laughs> that must be so. I'll find out and I'll get them send the video to you. Last couple, couple of questions for, from Ryan. 
favourite players you, you played with and the best player you ever played against? Well, with Tyne or in general? Any, any Stuart, any. Favourite players I've played with and, and the best I've played against? Um, from my point of view, I'm going to just name two that comes up in my head. John Terry was the best centre half I've played against. Um, not because because he was so streetwise. I, I played against him in the Premier League, Ipswich v Chelsea. He was an 18-year-old lad coming through Stamford Bridge. Um, and he was so streetwise and intelligent for his age. I just was, I was so shocked. He was doing things to me um, and on the pitch that I've never come across with senior players before in my life. So, and then obviously he's gone on to play for England, but he was, he was way above his time at 18 years old. So I would say him. Um, playing with, uh, I want to go with a guy called Jim Magilton at Ipswich, who, who was the perfect centre midfield player for a striker or a forward player because he could pick a pass out, you could make a run thing, and he would pick you out and he would put it on, he would put it on your, on, on your, on your little toe if you wanted him to, from, from 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards. He was a forward-thinking midfield player who, who, who had a really good connect, connection with on the pitch. Um, so, yeah, those two stick out in my mind. Jim, Jim played at Sheffield Wednesday with, with me. Uh, really? and what a great, great player on the pitch, but off the pitch, what a fa- what fantastic nights we, we had. I can remember, and I, I got time, but I can remember it was his birthday and we all went out and he, he downed a pint of champagne. He downed a pint of champagne and it hit him straight away. And his first thing is, he took his top off in the middle of my uh, nightclub and Jim with a bit of a heavy lad anyway, wasn't he? And he was swinging his top round and he threw it up. It got stuck on fan in top of... Uh, <laughs> Club room. So Jim's there with no clothes on, and that's the last I'm going to tell you because there's other stuff that <laughs> ended up in a police cell that night. So I'm not even going to carry on with that one. But what a great, great play on and off the field into you. Brilliant lad, yeah, brilliant guy. Chief, final. Um, I would say a play with Andy Cole uh, before he went to Newcastle. Outstanding. He, he was he was just brilliant uh, when when he wanted to. Um, I'm not, uh, when he wants to play or turn it on, he, he was outstanding. He, he used to carry us at Bristol City when we was there, and he, he, he was different class. Um, played against, <laughs> I, I would say, Georgie King, King Cladsey when um, he was at um, was it, when he was at was it Man City. City, it, City, and did he play derby as well? Did he yeah, when it, when he was at Man City, and um, we played there once, and. Uh, we was, <laughs> yeah, we were six no at half time. We were six no down. Uh, I'm not trying to thought for the common denominator here, but we were six no at half time, and he just ran the show. He was just oh, unbelievable. unbelievable. I was at the half, on the halfway line just watching him just do all his stuff. It was a, it was a great watch. Brilliant. And we, we've run out of time. But I'm, I've got one final question, and I don't ever do this. I don't like to ever. Have a go at any players. We've we've all we're all players ourselves. But one player that and I and obviously I weren't there at the time. But one player that fans always ask about was George Donis. Like what? Like he never really played at town. But what kind of a player with George George Donis? He got a lot of stick, but didn't it? Didn't I think it was Steve Bruce's first transfer one wanted. What were you like in training, Stu? You might know a little bit more. Uh, do you know what? I, I actually liked him. He was a he was a, he was a good lad, you know. Uh, you know, you know, he, when you're in training with someone and they're under pressure, you're not playing well, under pressure for for whatever reason. But as a person and a lad, I really liked him. I thought he was a genuine, not a uh, not a big time bone in his body. He was quite humble. So. Uh, it didn't quite work for him, you know, but as a person, I liked him. And then that, that's how I see people. And, you know, I, I take, obviously you're footballers, but it helps if you like someone as well. And I think I, I liked him. I can't say any more about him, you know, as a, as a it, sometimes it doesn't work for you at a club, but as it make you a bad person and you want a bad person. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, 
Lads, that's been it's absolute flown again. Can I thank you both for, for giving your time? We really appreciate it. It's been an absolute super a night again. So on behalf of everybody watching, thank thank you you two for, for giving it your time. Really appreciate it. And thank you guys. Up the terriers. Stewie Chief, if you want a smoothie, you want to, I'll see you on Grandpa Greens. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes. Me, me and Stewie, well, Stewie lives near Upper Mill, but I'm I've just found Upper Mill for lot since lockdown and we're I spend half of my time at Gunpowder Greens and you're always there, Stewie, aren't you? So yeah. it's worth going for the fantastic ice cream and, and chocolate eggs, isn't it? Oh, the Sundays are unbelievable. But, but there's other ice cream parlours around as well. Yeah. Stewie, just you two, the video, I think somebody's put the video on on this, Kent, this fried chicken. So if you want to stay behind when everybody's gone, we'll have a look at it together if you want. Uh, yeah, but, I'd like to see that. Yeah, well, it might explain and it. The video of what, baby? That Kentucky Fried Chicken video. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, yeah, all right. thank, thank you all, all, all for listening. Uh, next week, it's Tommy Smith and uh, Dean Whitehead talking about, obviously, David Wagner and, and the Premier League league uh, years, which should be good. Obviously, if you want to bid on uh, Ryan Schofield's uh, signed match worn shirt, sponsored by Magic Rock, uh, feel free to go on to the, to the website. Don't forget your discount. Uh, for your discount beer, uh, passcode, discount codes, Bulver, and watch for the for the video coming out and you've got a chance again to win some Magic Rock uh, case of beer. All you have to do is answer the question and retweet on social media. Thank you all for, for joining us again. I really appreciate it. And Chief Stewart, thanks for giving your time up. It's been after, absolute brilliant. So thank you all again. Enjoy. We'll see you next Thursday, but... Enjoy your few, well, your week, a couple of weekends off uh, without what, without having to any added pressure in, in watching town. Uh, and I'll see you all next Thursday. Thank you all for joining me. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh my <What>? god! <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> Ain't as bad as I thought it'd be. And what would it for? Huh? What would it for? What it for KFC? Yeah, I love chicken. But I don't know what it was for. <laughs> <laughs> we should have put it on. We should have put it on when everybody was there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I was a bit worried what it would be about. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. I did not. It kept coming up on the, on the message. And I just didn't have a clue what, what it was. Oh, now I know anyway. Is it with the very first with the very first question they, they put on and I thought well, I can't start with that because I don't I don't know what it is. And <laughs> it up. <laughs> yeah, but how young how young did you look though, Stewie? I know, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? God. I was 25 then, I think 20, 26. What? I look about 18. I think you'd just come to, to that's I think that'll be in your first year, won't it? Yeah, would it? It was that kit, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. That might have been first year. Was that was that before the Panasonic kit? Uh, no, it was. No, that was. Yeah, well, it would have been. been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was still Panasonic. Was it still Panasonic hey, that time? How baggy were our shirts back then? By the way, oh, oh, baggy shirt and heavy. You used to get wet and you used to go into trip half time for to get your foot shirt changed, but they won't change it for you. You have to another <laughs> wearing a wet shirt out. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And people, people, you, we didn't have any shirt, did we? It, you were number, if you were given number nine or number ten, it, it didn't matter what, it. what size you were. If it would have been chief, me or, or you, Stuart, it was one size. size. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got your, yours or Jeffo's from the season before. Sorry, it's from last season, mate. You've got to put that one on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have got gone, is you're in trouble. If you got gone, is that that the image, yeah. <laughs> This depends. Cranky. Oh, wow. No, that was good, that movie. Oh, no, brilliant. Chief, really thank you. See you soon, mate. Really, really Chief, stay in touch, it. mate. Don't be a stranger, you. Well, the, the, the thing is, well, you don't ring, do you? Well, the phone don't ring either way. Just, 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 no. just, just, just not be strangers. <laughs> yes, mate, you know. Bye, mate. Look after yourself, mate. Stuart, Stuart, don't text him. Whatever you do, I text I I yeah. two mums. You know when I text you and you answer me? Yeah. Chief don't answer text, so so you've got no. to ring him. No, no is. There, there's something wrong with my phone, isn't there? There's something wrong with my phone, so that's why I didn't get it. But 
You have to ring. So we can have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you very much.